welcome to Chess TV. We hope you all had a great week. In this week's episode, we will initially turn to Adriana, who will present all the latest within the world of chess. Some of the headlines are that the FIDE elections are concluded, and so are the ECU elections. Also, the intercultural chess tournament that was played in Germany. I will then, together with Alfred, continue our analyzing of the so-called Pelican variation, which is a really interesting variation within the Sicilian defense. You will in the chess puzzle be challenged to find checkmate in two moves by Antonia. And in the chess history, Professor Dr. Arne Johansson continues the exciting story about Café de la Regance. The most important chess-related event in Europe, the election of the European Chess Union president, has been held and Silvio Danailov is the new president of the European Chess Union. He received 30 votes, defeating Ali Nihat Yazidzi, who had 24. Silvio Danailov inherits Boris Kutin, who, reg uh, who registered a very successful period for the ECU during his mandate. Danailov has promised to work on relationships with UNESCO, to collaborate with Mensa and create a club of chess journalists. We want to wish the new president good luck. Between October 26th and November the 5th, the 17th International Chess Festival M. Tigorin Memorial will be held in St. Petersburg, Russia. The festival will consist of two tournaments, a rapid chess tournament and a classical chess tournament. The winner of this tournament will be qualified to the final stage of the Russian Cup. Mikhail Ivanovich Tigorin was a Russian chess player who lived during the second half of the 19th century. Tigorin has an opening named after him and several variations as well because of his success in chess. The sign-up for the events is still open. In memory of Karen Astrian, the Armenian Chess Federation is organizing the third annual Karen Astrian Memorial Chess Tournament. The tournament will take place on October the 4th to the 14th in the prominent resort town of Yermuk. Karen Astrian was one of the top 100 ranked chess players in the world and one of Armenia's best chess players and was the, on the winning team in the 2006 Chess Olympiad in Turin. Karen unfortunately passed away at only 28 years old. The tournament will be played in 9 round Swiss and already players such as Grandmaster Tigran El Petrosian rated 26-13 and Sergei Volkov rated 25-95 will participate. Between January the 3rd and the 10th, the Vietnam Chess Federation will organize the first HD Bank Cup Open Chess Tournament, which will be played in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. The 9-round Swiss tournament time control is 90 minutes per player with an addition of 30 seconds after each move. The players will fight for the prize fund of $25,000. Be sure to register before December the 20th. The 4th Mediterranean 2017 Open Chess Tournament will be held from November the 13th to the 20th this year. The tournament will be played in the city of Rijeka on the Croatian coast of the Adriatic City. Their player attracting motto is chess with a scent of the sea and it seems to be working. Several grandmasters rated over 2600 are participating. So if you want to have a chance to play against super strong competition in a beautiful setting, be sure to sign up. Kirisanilum Zinov was re-elected for the FIDE president on September the 29th. Ilum Zinov won with 95 to 55 votes and thus he will be president of FIDE until 2014. The election day started in County Mansisk early in the morning in a hall packed with members of the chess federations of the world. Election results were announced two hours later with Kirsten Nilem Zinov winning 95 to 55. Congratulations! We are in an era of global convergence. The world is getting smaller and the challenge of coexistence between people from different cultures is more exciting than ever. Ten years ago, the German chess club Satranch Club 2000 was founded by Turkish-originated chess friends and chess enthusiasts. And right from the start, the club invited players from all nations. Now, Germans and Turks, Serbs and Kosovars, among other nationalities, are playing shoulder to shoulder for their Satranch Club. It is one of the few chess clubs in the world which contains intercultural fraternization in its Articles of Association. Other chess clubs, especially in northern Rhine-Westphalia, are intending to follow this archetype. The Satranch Club organized their fourth intercultural rapid chess tournament last week on September 26th. 
The tournament was held for the 10th anniversary of the association and it was also an official European Union event on the European Day of Languages. The slogan was, we all play in one language. The undefeated winner was the talented player Carlo Pauli, runner-up was Marcus Ecker and the top player of the uh, Satranch club Alexander Johannes was third. The senior prize was awarded to Peter Fete and the junior prize to Sophie Schröter. The first Saturn chairman, Given Manai, wishes to congratulate everyone for their hard work in organizing and preparing the tournament and especially Arbeiter Isaac Gilmas, as well as invite everyone to future events for the Saturn Chess Club. We would like to thank Given Manai for the information and the footage. Last week we started to look at the pelican variation, we analyzed the introducing moves and we ended the episode in this position where the Sveshnikov variation is to be introduced by Black's B5. Alfred, what happens now after Black's B5? Besides the obvious threat B4, which forks the knights, the move also blocks the white A3 knight from getting to the C4 square, effectively locking the knight to the A3 square. White is forced to act and can here play either knight d5 or bishop takes on f6. In this week's episode, we'll analyze bishop takes on f6, the move which I myself recommend. Black is supposed to play g takes f6 here, but if the queen takes, white can punish black with knight to d5. The now threatened queen is forced to retreat to d8 in order to protect from the white threat knight to c7 check with a fork and white answers with c4. If black will play b4 in this position, white will get the upper hand after queen to a4. Black plays bishop to d7 to protect the c6 knight, and white plays knight to b5, threatening a check on c7. If black now takes the knight, black loses since white now will be able to take the rook on a8 with the queen, and after black's recapture, white plays knight to c7 check followed by king to e7 and knight takes on a8, leaving white with a strong material advantage. If black instead of playing b4 plays knight to e7, a capture on e b5 follows and knight, to d knight takes on d5 is played by black. White does here capture on d5 with the queen and black answers by playing bishop to e6, which is fo followed by queen to d2, d5, b takes on a6, bishop takes on a3, and bishop to b5 check, giving white a clear advantage. Black can of course avoid these dire continuations by playing g takes on f6 instead of recapturing with the queen. White does still play knight to d5 here, but black is here torn between two possible continuations. Either black play plays f5 or bishop to g7. F5 was long considered the only possible move in this position. Later on, the move bishop to g7 has become more popular though. The th plan behind the, b the bishop move is to enable the possibility to play knight to e7 and removing the powerful white d5 knight before playing f5. If knight to e7 is played before bishop to g7, white can take an f6 with the knight, ending the game since it is a checkmate. Today though, we'll analyze what will happen after f5 before bishop to g7. For white to take on f5 is not recommended by me, since that would develop the black bishop and totally resign the center to black. Instead white is to play bishop to d3, which is followed by bishop to e6, castle kingside and bishop to g7. The position is quite amazing, both parties have their strengths as well as their weaknesses. Black has a really strong presence in the center, but his position is quite holy, so to say. While white has a well-developed position, except for the knight on a3, of course. We will see you again next week with a new episode when we will continue with analyzing this variation. So see you then!
Today's chess puzzle is checkmate in two moves in a position that arose in a match between the grandmasters Spielmann and Steen in 1980 in London. It was a 34 move long game that actually ended in checkmate, which is quite rare in games between grandmasters because the grandmasters usually resign before the checkmate is performed. In the position you soon will see, there is a checkmate in two moves that white makes on black. So good luck! Let's start by looking at our candidate moves that we have to choose from in this position. We see immediately that we can play either queen takes on d5 check, queen to b5 check, or queen to b4 check. The question that we of course have to ask ourselves is whether it is wise to perform a queen exchange in this position, seen both from a material point of view, such as a positional point of view. Well, let's not forget that we are under with two pieces and that after the queen exchange, it will be really difficult to get to the king in just two moves. No, there will not be a queen exchange. We should indeed allow the queen to stay on the board. The second possible variation begins with queen to b5 check. This looks like a very natural move in this position because it prevents black from escaping to c4 and c6. But what happens after king to d6? Well, we can try to chase him, but that doesn't result in a checkmate in just two moves, and black is clearly better. The right move is of course queen to b4 check. This move prevents black from escaping to d6, and the queen has also more territory now than when she stood on b5. Black can only choose to go to c6 with the king, and then we checkmate him with queen to b6 Checkmate. Well, in this game, John Spielman showed that despite of material disadvantage, one can definitely turn a game so dramatically and win it. Steen actually performed a bad move in the 24th move and then gave Spielman a chance for this win, which Spielman took advantage of. And this was the result, a checkmate. So great job everybody! Last week I began to talk about the most famous of all chess parlors, namely the Café de la Regence in Paris, which was a hot spot for chess for most of the 18th and 19th centuries. In the 1840s, Pierre Charles Fournier saint amand took over the French chess throne from de la Bourdonnais, and thus could be considered as the leading chess player in the world. Saint Amand visited London in 1843 and took the opportunity to defeat Howard Staunton in a brief and somewhat informal match. But they also then agreed on a longer match that would decide who was the stronger of the two and with it probably the world's strongest player. The match was held in December 1843 and of course at the Café de la Regence. Staunton won the match and thus broke the long period of French domination in the world of chess. saint amand played an important role in the chess life at the Café de la Regence, but also had a fascinating career outside of chess. He was secretary to the governor of French Guinea, and uh, that is up to the time that he protested against the slave trade. 
He was then dismissed from that position, but tried his luck as an actor, without much success though. However, he made better luck as wine merchant and eventually became captain of the French National Guard, but that was during the revolution in 1848. Three years later, he became consul of California and uh, when he eventually was back in Paris, he was somewhat of a host for Morphy during the visit in 1858. Morphy, well, he arrived by train to Paris just in time to enjoy a nice dinner with his private secretary and assistant Frederick Edge. Later in the evening, they went to the Café de la Régence. The air was heavy with tobacco smoke in the café when Morphy and Edge got there, and the first person they saw was the gigantic chess book author Monsieur Morel, also known as the Rhinoceros. They went on to the back room where a game was underway. A waitress received them and, without knowing who she was talking to, told them that the very strong player Daniel Harwitz was elsewhere that day, but that he was expected to return to Paris and Café de la Régence the following day to meet the famous American player Paul Morphy. The match did not go so well for Harwitz, who took a break from the match at 4-2 to Morphy. During the break, Morphy offered to play a blindfold simultaneous exhibition against eight players. It created a lot of excitement and newspapers in Paris wrote about the event. The event was of course held at the Café de la Régence and the opposition was really tough. The room was filled with spectators and large numbers were also gathered outside the café. The game began at noon against eight selected players and the gigantic Monsieur Morel walked around the tables and blew out smoke like a volcano from his pipe. This image from the simultaneous exhibition was published in various newspapers at that time. Morphy's combinations in the game against Monsieur Bouchy was so impressive that the English chess writer George Walker wrote in the newspaper's Bell's Life, this game is worthy of being inscribed in letters of gold on the wall of the London club. The end result was six wins and two draws after approximately 10 hours of play. Morphy had been sitting almost motionless all the time without either food or drink. When the undefeated but exhausted Morphy rose, cheers were heard and not least from the many Englishmen and Americans who were among the spectators. Despite help from the big Monsieur Morel, it took Morphy half an hour to get through the crowd to leave the café. We will return next week with another achievement of the so-called amateur society at the Café de la Régence. So, see you then. Thank you for having followed Chess TV. Next week we will be back with the latest chess news, the continuation of the Pelican variation, and a new chess puzzle, and of course a brand new chess history episode. See you then. Jumping through hoops backwards